Okay, so throughout all of human history, there are a select few images that tell a story of a thousand words in just one picture. And in the sports field alone, there are already hundreds if not thousands of those as well. But never before has a singular image become more synonymous with one team and its complicated history than the iconic Browns quarterback jersey. Just by looking at it, you can almost smell the stench of despair through your screen as you read every single name with a different emotional reaction to each failed human experiment on that jersey. And you know, that's that's why I got this board here. Sorry, Tom, it's, it's not your video. There we go. All right, yeah. That's totally gonna stay. You know, I was thinking it's already got a, a Raider sticker on it, as you can see. It's already infused with sadness, so I might as well track all 36 starting Browns quarterbacks as of the recording of this video and put them on this little board behind me so it's easier for you to, <laughs> to really keep track of everything. So... Let's get into it. Without further ado, it's time. This video has been months in the making, so join me as we take the deepest of dives into how the Cleveland Browns became the most miserable franchise in all of sports and the 36 and counting quarterbacks that all failed to bring Browns fans eternal happiness. And it all started in the fateful year of 1995. It came down to a simple proposition. I had no choice. The Browns are indeed coming to Baltimore. I usually start these documentary videos out with a whole cliche of introducing some old dude who had a ton of money and then let greed consume him and, um, I'm gonna f***ing do it again. Forgive me, but meet Art Modell, a name that instantly makes all Browns fans over the age of 30 have an episode, but why is that? I mean, sh surely he didn't do something that terrible to explain why Browns fans were routinely arrested for turning his gravesite into a public urinal, right? I mean, come on, that's going too far. Well, I'm not excusing those actions, but uh, there's reasons for it. And first, let me explain who Art Modell even was. In 1961, Modell was part of a group that purchased the Browns for $4 million, and during his time owning the Browns, he bared witness to some of the most cruel forms of gridiron torture in NFL history, with the fumble and the drive just being two of many iconic plays that happened against Cleveland, and with that much pain, you'd think the Browns fan base would die out, but no, if anything, they grew stronger through their shared bond of suffering, and despite fielding a few really terrible teams in the 90s coached by some grumpy old guy named Bill Belichick, the fan base was as loyal as ever. I mean, there's no denying it. This team had some of the best fans in the country, and they also had iconic players in their past in figures like Otto Graham, Jim Brown, and sexual assaults aside, Paul Brown, Paul Warfield, and so many others. And after a relatively solid run in the 80s, uh, surely they weren't going anywhere anytime soon. But then Art Modell whipped it out. The trump card that changed everything when rumors began to circulate that he was about to do the unthinkable. Art Modell was talking with Maryland officials in an attempt to move the Cleveland Browns to Baltimore. Nobody could believe it, but it was official. On November 6th, 1995, flat in the middle of the NFL season, Art Modell just said, you know what, eh, f*** it, and announced the Cleveland Browns would be moving to Baltimore forever. Literally, in the middle of the season, he just ripped Browns fans' hearts out and threw it on the ground and just squashed it. I mean, could you imagine if, like, the Buffalo Bills just in the middle of the year decided, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna move to Sacramento next season. That's what it was like for Browns fans at the time. And from here on out, until further notice at least, the Browns as an organization and basically a brand would literally cease to exist. But I mean, come on, w was that it? Was Art Modell really just an evil incarnation of greed whose intention was to hurt the city of Cleveland as bad as possible? And well, <laughs> maybe, but how we got to the worst moment in Browns history of their team leaving them was, complicated. First, early on in his time owning the Browns, Modell was actually offered multiple times to be part of a deal called Project Gateway, which would have built the Browns an entirely new stadium along with other local teams to help the city's economy. And a new stadium was needed badly, because one of the main reasons Modell had the Browns move in the first place was the rotting stadium they played in. It, it was... It was really bad, but allegedly, due to reasons varying from wanting to see the end of his lease in the Browns stadium to, well, his pride and ego, Modell backed out of Project Gateway and planned renovations to the stadium that eventually just never happened. And in the end, it's, it's really sad to say, but guess what? The NFL just doesn't care about the fans that much. Uh, the facts were that there was just more money to be made in Baltimore, and after a long emotional chat with future Browns owner Al Lerner, ironically, <laughs> Art Modell, with tears in his eyes, 
did what he thought was best from a soulless financial point of view, and in time, the Cleveland Browns roster became the current day Baltimore Ravens. But it didn't stop there, okay? I know this is supposed to be a quarterback-centered video, and it, trust me, it, it will be, but tragic irony is just, it's built into this Browns organization. Because after the Browns, as everyone knew them, were gone and the fans had their last season in Cleveland, the hate boners for Modell were just at their absolute peaks. And honestly, they were pretty warranted. He's obviously not the only guy to blame, but as Al Davis said himself, Modell is the one who spoke out adamantly against moving the Rams. He put a lot of obstacles in our way, the Raiders' way, in Los Angeles, and it's deja vu. Here he is standing up, changing everything he has said over 15 years in about one month. And ladies and gentlemen, the business side of the NFL at its absolute finest right here. And honestly, I, I hate to say this, but it's about to get so much worse. You think this is NFL executives at their absolute greediest? Well, get ready to learn how the Cleveland Browns came back into the NFL. So, Browns fans were already just devastated after losing their team because of the collective mistakes of the city and owner of the team they were forced to trust, but that's not all, because these Cleveland fans were forced to watch as their once proud orange helmet was painted a different color and rebranded to intentionally bury their past. And Ozzie Newsom, the Browns' former director of player personnel, a former Hall of Famer for the Browns, one of their best and most important humans in their entire franchise's existence. A man who was so loyal to Cleveland, he reportedly kept a jar of dirt from the Browns' last home game on his desk, even when he changed professions, held the general manager job of the Baltimore Ravens now. And in just his first season on the job, he helped bring in two Hall of Famers in the same draft in Jonathan Ogden and O.J. Simpson. So that, that, that can't feel great, but um, the success the Baltimore Ravens will grow into will uh, sting a little bit more later on. For now, though, the Browns needed to fight to even get their franchise back, which they did, actually. And the man who purchased the Cleveland Browns expansion team would be none other than Al Lerner, the same man who I mentioned earlier who helped f*** Browns fans over by helping gaslight Art Modell into going for the kill. Now, how did the NFL let this happen, you may ask? Well, simply, the dude had the most money. I mean, nothing else matters other than that, right? I mean, as long as the cash flows in, we're good. So, just like that, the 1999 expansion Cleveland Browns were born. And unlike their past iteration of the team that was built on the innovation of Paul Brown and the dominance of Otto Graham and later Jim Brown, these Cleveland Browns, these fake Browns, were built on nothing more than greed and sold to the highest bidder who just so happened to be one of the most hated men in Cleveland history. So, <laughs> don't mean to skip ahead here, but maybe this helps explain why, no matter the talent this team will see much later on, in the back of your mind, there will always be the thought of, well, the Cleveland Browns are always going to be the Cleveland Browns. But... <laughs> To, to stay in the present timeline, most Cleveland fans felt like they had no choice, and those poor souls were forcefully dragged down into the pit of the initial process of becoming the hollow organism of agony, also known as Cleveland Brown fans, yet again. Ugh, Stockholm Syndrome, it's, it's powerful. And so, it all began all over again. The Cleveland Browns were reborn, formed from the fallen ashes of Art Modell's wallet. They were back and ready to start causing irreversible mental damage to Browns fans everywhere because right off the bat, the Browns as an expansion team needed time to get people to start, you know, working. I mean, the Carolina Panthers and Jacksonville Jaguars, the two most recent expansion teams at the time, both had well over 600 days to get ready for their first game, whereas the New Age Cleveland Browns barely had over a year before their first game even started, so with that little time, uh, a disaster would predictably ensue. So they took their time and decided the first thing that they should all do collectively was panic, because they did need a strong voice in the front office, uh, but they really rushed into their first decision and basically just said, you know what? Let's just hire somebody who's come from success. And the first guy they brought in was Carmen Policy, a former 49ers executive to be the CEO, and then they hired his partner in crime with another 49er and Dwight Clark to be the GM. And I, I guess this all sounded good in theory, maybe, but as it would later be revealed, Dwight Clark wasn't even remotely supposed to get the general manager job at all. He wasn't even close to being prepared to be remotely responsible for the transactions the team would make, but given the time crunch they were in, they kind of had no choice but to keep moving forward because 
remember, they didn't even have a head coach at the time yet, so they needed to deal with that still. And I'll try to make this quick, but basically after trying to steal another 49er away and Steve Mariucci to be the head coach and Mike Holmgren also later failed, they still knew how important it was to at least bring in some guy with experience. So after laughing at Bernie Kosar, one of their most respected former players for even suggesting bringing back Bill Belichick, the Browns felt like they had their guy. And Vikings offensive coordinator, Brian Billick. He was perfect for the job, a guy who was actively leading one of the most revolutionary offenses ever. Surely he would be a perfect fit on this team that our future protagonist Tim Couch will later describe as just a bunch of guys, and I, I can't see why in the hell this job wouldn't be attractive to someone like Billick. I mean, as the great Joe Kim Noah said, uh, why wouldn't anyone ever want to live in Cleveland, right? I mean, it's, it's a perfect city. I mean, I never heard anybody say I'm going to Cleveland on vacation. What's so good about Cleveland? The only issue was that Brian Billick's Minnesota Vikings had just come off of a... Uh, set situation in the NFC Championship game. So all the Browns had to do was give the man some space, you know, let him grieve and just give him a minute to collect his thoughts. And the, the second the game ended, the Browns sent Dwight Clark out to Minnesota to kidnap him back to Cleveland and basically force him to take the job. Well then, um, a bold business tactic for sure. And shockingly, it actually rubbed Brian Billick the wrong way. Turns out there was another team that was interested in his services that actually cared about his emotions. And in the end, Brian Billick sided with that team, which turned out to be the f***ing Baltimore Ravens. I mean, God, the, the, the Browns, they're, they're just they're the best of the best when it comes to football comedy. And to, to be honest with you, that's what this video is going to devolve into eventually. Just one big comedy where we all laugh at the Browns for all of their horrible, horrible mistakes. So that sucked, especially to see Brian join the Ravens. But as long as he doesn't win anything important, you know, it won't be... It won't be that bad. And in the end of the Browns coaching search, there were a ton of guys available, such as Andy Reid, John Fox, Marvin Lewis, Herman Edwards, and more, who admittedly also probably didn't want to live in Cleveland, but this is the man the Browns settled on. F***ing Chris Palmer. A man who had zero coaching experience and never got any head coaching experience after his time with Cleveland. But the Browns' already inexperienced front office looked past all of that and hired former Jaguars offensive coordinator Chris Palmer to be the first ever head coach of the expansion Cleveland Browns. So these are the guys we're going to be rolling with for the next couple of years. And so what you've all been waiting for has now arrived. The Cleveland Browns needed a quarterback, the perfect guy to capture the hearts of these new Browns fans and inspire a generation. So with the first overall pick in the 1999 NFL Draft, not only did the Browns have to get this decision right for football purposes to give them a franchise quarterback, but as LeBron James would later prove for the Cavaliers, the city of Cleveland as a whole, their entire infrastructure could have just changed forever if they hit on this one pick. <sighs> Now, okay, before we start giving them a shit for getting this pick wrong, because we all knew they did, let's see what their options were, okay? In the 1999 NFL Draft, the headline was simple. There were three quarterbacks, far and away better than all the others. Tim Couch, Donovan McNabb, and Achilles Smith. There was also a standout running back prospect by the name of Ricky Williams, who Chris Palmer later said he wanted the draft, but realistically, he was never even on the table. And the conversation was between these three guys. Who would be the first quarterback for the new Cleveland Browns in franchise history? But to be honest with you, this was never really an argument, okay? I could play up the drama, but McNabb was cool and all, but Tim Couch was f dominant at Kentucky. Sort of. And when the 1999 NFL Draft came, the Cleveland Browns selected Timothy Couch first overall. It immediately signed the man to a record-breaking seven-year, $48 million contract. Jesus Christ. Now that they just broke the money barrier, I guess it was time to do the same thing to the quarterback that they just drafted. Before the 1999 season began, the Cleveland Browns roster was just terrible. I mean, obviously though, I mean, remember, they were an expansion team, but they also got absolutely cucked by the NFL in the expansion draft. It's, it's a little confusing, but basically teams could protect more players than they could in past expansion drafts, and given the Browns didn't really have a scouting team, they really just had to sift through the trash and assemble as many old veterans as possible to just feel the team. Granted, they did miss out on Kurt Warner famously, but 
I mean, come on, let's be fair here. Do you really think that Kurt Warner's career would have been the same if he was a third string quarterback for the Cleveland Browns in 1999? But knowing this, knowing how awful the roster was on paper, it seemed like the Browns were actually making a great decision by telling Tim Couch himself to his face, there is no chance he plays at all during the entire 1999 season. You're not, we're not going to play you your whole rookie year. That's what they told me. The plan was for me to sit the whole season. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But then the 1999 offseason came to an end. And before week one, it was announced that career trash can quarterback Ty Detmer would be the first ever starting quarterback for the new age Cleveland Browns. So... You know, first guy, most people think it was Tim Couch, but it was actually Ty Detmer. So let me let me add his name to the board first here. The first guy. How do you how do you spell his name? Nice. So it was time. Let's do this. Game number one in Cleveland Browns history. The stadium was popping. Everyone was hyped up just to see some football again. And after a hard fought game, the Browns played one of their best games of the entire season and fell to Pittsburgh 43 to 0 on Sunday Night Football. They broadcasted this massacre in front of the entire country. I mean, but I mean, are you, are you even a little bit surprised? Th this was one of those games where I could reel off stats for like three minutes about how you even lose a professional sporting game this fucking horribly, but instead, let's, well, let's laugh at the Browns here for a moment, okay? Remember how I said they made it crystal clear to Tim Couch, no interpretation otherwise, that they were going to give him the whole season to learn from the sideline and not just get sacrificed to the eternal football deities behind an O-line held together by Ben Gay and Weed. Well, that whole plan went straight through the drywall in, in, in just week one, because in that game, down by 36 points, Tim Couch would enter the game in replacement of Ty Detmer. And something something, there's some deep foreshadowing here, because Tim Couch threw a terrible interception on his first ever NFL throw. And now, Ty Detmer was officially benched, basically never to be mentioned again, and Tim Couch became the second of the failed experiments in Cleveland. And you know, for a, for a select few players here, I think, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna draw a picture of them. So, get ready to see my... Elite drawing skills put on display. All right, I think I, I think I pretty much nailed it, to be honest with you. All right, Tim Couch. Nice. That poor guy. So just like that, the Browns fed Tim Couch to the wolves. And there's no sugarcoating this. It was a fucking cataclysmic disaster. The 1999 Browns were so bad, it took a Hail Mary and a game-winning field goal just to barely escape a winless season. That was, that was an unintentional joke there. And Tim Couch finished his rookie season showing flashes of potential, but at the end of the day, it was all buried beneath his record of being the most sacked rookie quarterback ever at the time, something that the Browns coaching staff seemed to be trying to avoid early on, and as guys like David Carr and Bryce Young would later prove, shattering your rookie quarterback's confidence immediately is arguably the worst thing you can ever do to develop a quarterback. And that's exactly what they did. The 1999 Browns went 2-14, and 14, and the most notable thing that happened on the field would be Orlando Brown Sr. almost getting his career ended by a rogue flag, but thankfully he managed to recover and sign with the Baltimore, <laughs> the Baltimore Ravens. As I said, though, there were flashes of talent from the Browns franchise quarterback, okay? He wasn't all terrible, and at the absolute very least, Tim Couch wasn't Achilles Smith, which is an overwhelming positive, and the 2000 NFL Draft was also just around the corner, and was another great chance to add some more talent, because, once again, they had the first overall pick, where they used it to draft Penn State defensive end Courtney Brown, a man who, um... For those of you under the age of 30, you probably have never heard of before, which, given that the next three defensive players off the board would go on to be pro bowlers at the very least, um, yeah, maybe Dwight Clark and the rest of that front office in Cleveland had it the first f***ing clue as to what they were doing. Not saying Courtney Brown didn't have talent, because he definitely did, but we'll speak more on what went wrong with him in a few minutes, because... <laughs> Boy, do we have probably the worst quarterbacking season in the history of professional sports to get into right now, so... Let's do it. I'm excited. First, the 2000 season for the Browns was, uh, 
not good at all, even for their standards. However, that doesn't mean there weren't few and faint bright spots, and if you're a Tim Couch supporter, the first three games of this season would probably be your main piece of evidence to say that he had it in him all along, as he was averaging 245 yards per game, almost two touchdowns, and had a QB rating of 107.7. And most importantly, he was leading the Browns to a 2-1 record, looking like the team's most valuable player. Yeah, breaking news. Turns out number one overall pick actually has talent in him. But but now, it looked like the time had come. Just like the other expansion teams at the time, and the Panthers and Jaguars, the Browns looked like a winning record and a playoff spot was inevitable in just their second season. And that narrative was only pushed further with their gritty win versus the Steelers, to the point where some were legitimately calling the Cleveland Browns the f expansion Tim Couch, Chris Palmer led Cleveland Browns as legitimate Super Bowl contenders in the AFC. I, I'm just gonna say it. Neil Gordon, all right, the guy who said this, uh, you're absolutely f tripping, buddy. And he was proved wrong on the field pretty much immediately, too, as Tim Couch's next four games took a real dramatic swing. And as it turns out, when you have a young quarterback who struggles with holding onto the ball for too long, when you pair that with a terrible offensive line, that is a perfect recipe for the prequel to David Carr. And not trying to get these dudes caught in the crossfire, but by year's end, these were Tim Couch's leading receivers. Kevin Johnson was actually pretty solid for them, I won't lie, but these other guys, uh, I, I would guess fewer than 1% of you actually know who these dudes are. And, <laughs> and this fourth guy, Tony Ramirez, I, I actually just completely made him up. He's, he's not even a real football player. He, he does wealth management, I guess. Anyway, then after Tim Couch and the Browns began to relapse, the man fractured his thumb and would miss the rest of the year. And because his fellow quarterback Ty Detmer from last year tore his f Achilles in preseason, the man who would replace Tim Couch would be current Jaguars head coach Doug Peterson, who outside of 1999 and 2000 never started a single game in the NFL. And after going through the film of his couple of appearances, I... I think I know what passing a kidney stone feels like because in, in his first game as the Browns starting quarterback against the Pittsburgh Steelers, who they actually beat earlier that same year, Peterson went 9 for 20 on passes and damn near lit the grass on fire with 61 passing yards. And to finish it all off, the dude threw three interceptions as the Browns failed to score a single point losing the game 0-22. to Maybe, just maybe, Tim Couch was more important than the Browns thought he was, and as the season was already so far lost at this point, in week 14, the Browns tried their luck at rookie sixth-round pick Spurgeon Wynn, because for some reason they believed that a sixth-round quarterback in the 2000 draft could be useful to some sort. But whatever. In Spurgeon's first game playing, uh, the Cleveland Browns picked up negative nine net passing yards. And throughout that whole game, a grand total of 159 feet worth of yards was picked up by the entire Browns offense that day. <laughs> I repeat, the Cleveland Browns, led by Spurgeon Wynn, didn't even pick up half the yards in a football field during an entire game, and they lost the game 48 to zero. And a few weeks later, they finished the 2000 NFL season as one of the worst teams in the history of the NFL, going three and 13. Doug Peterson became the third quarterback to start for them, and uh, Spurgeon Wynn became the fourth. But um, I'm, I'm not drawing faces for them because they don't deserve it, to be honest with you. I, you, you can't even read it. Well, whatever. I don't, I don't care. I did a funny with the Browns QB room this year on another video, and to be honest with you, it, it's, it still works here. This Browns quarterback room was putrid. And I know this season took a while to get through, but I, I just have a soft spot for certain football teams that are so terrible at what they do, I, I just can't help myself from going maybe a little bit too in-depth. But just know I found like eight different insane stats from this team, but I'll just share one with you, okay? Because this one got me. Not only were the Cleveland Browns ranked dead last in the NFL in total offense, but still to this day, no other team has scored less points than the Cleveland Browns did in the year 2000. Even their winless 2017 season that we'll get to in time scored 73 more points on the year than this 2000 Cleveland Browns squad. They were actually that terrible. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna give you another stat too. I, they only had five games all year long scoring more than 10 points. And I know it's not a fair comparison at all because of era difference, but last year's 2023 Carolina Panthers had fucking 
eight straight games of scoring more than 10 points per game. So I'm not even sure that we'll ever see a team as bad as the 2000 Cleveland Browns ever again. But wait, there's more. Because before we go into the 2001 season, I gotta throw in one more shank into Browns fans' hearts. Because re remember that Brian Billick guy and Ozzie Newsome who are in the Baltimore Ravens facility? Well, turns out they f around and won the Super Bowl that year, giving Browns fans a mere glimpse of the true sight of hell as Art Modell lifted up the Lombardi Trophy and with the staff and players and team that should have been theirs. All right, we're done, okay? I, I won't go any further into the 2000 season, I, I swear. And surely it's all uphill from here. And Tim Couch was already f dismembered and betrayed by his own hogs. And Chris Palmer was obviously fired after winning just five games in two years. And to show how thankful they were for his services, Carmen Policy, the team's president, didn't just hit him with a stray, but pointed the whole ass barrel at him and tried to scapegoat Palmer for all the problems they had. And... To replace him, they brought in former University of Miami head coach Butch Davis to save the team from actually just going bankrupt, and Bruce Arians, Peyton Manning's quarterback coach, would now be the offensive coordinator. Oh, it's so funny. They think they have hope. And I get that what Butch Davis did with Miami's program was truly magical, but th this is the goddamn New Age Cleveland Browns, where dreams go to get thrust through the meat grinder, leaving nothing but horrid memories. And right away, they decided to toss away another first round pick when they selected defensive tackle Gerard Warren third overall. It's truly incredible how they keep doing this. According to many people in the Browns front office, they had their eyes set and unwavered on taking future Patriots Hall of Famer Richard Seymour instead, and most mock drafts, even back then, had them going a completely different direction, taking some running back who you've probably never heard of before, and it was even stated that the previous regime before Butch Davis was hired was already in love with Ladanian Tomlinson too, so it was either Richard Seymour or Ladanian Tomlinson with the third overall pick, which, I mean, you can't really go wrong with either one of them. But no, when Butch Davis came in, he basically transferred GM Dwight Clark power to himself, which seemed to be an unspoken incentive to even get him in Cleveland because, you know, who wants to live in Cleveland? And in came Gerard Warren, also known as Big Money, which is, you know, not a super positive nickname. And the 2000 season then began, and you know, it actually went very, very well. Uh, yeah, I'm not even, I'm not even lying to you. Tim Couch started the whole year, so nothing to add in terms of quarterbacks, and the Browns finished the 2001 season going 7-9. and nine. Incredible work, boys. With Tim Couch showing major signs of progress, even having one of the best games a quarterback had all year in a 41-38 win versus the Titans. But, um, th this is the Cleveland Browns. So, although there were some positives, the negatives were just way too heavy, and we, we can't look past them even this season. Courtney Brown, the former first overall pick from 2000, battled <sighs> knee and ankle problems all year long and only played in five games. And even in the games he actually played in, he wasn't super impactful, which sucked, but... <laughs> the funniest part about this year is the Browns actually could have made the playoffs if the famous Bottlegate game didn't happen. Because in this game, okay, l listen closely, because this is some A-tier bullshit. Versus the Jaguars in week 14, Tim Couch found receiver Quincy Morgan for a first down, which he did drop, but they called it a catch initially, and the Browns were able to then spike the ball and deny a replay from happening because, you know, it happened two plays earlier. However, the referees decided, you know what? No, we're just going to actively break the rules of football and review a play that happened two plays ago and ruled the pass to Morgan incomplete, and then because the bottles were just raining down from the sky, the zebras called the game right then and there. Awkwardly, the NFL then made them come back onto the field and kneel the game out, but yeah, this was just some, some usual Cleveland Browns buffoonery. So all they had to do now was carry that momentum that they had to end the season, I guess, to the year of 2002, and hope that Butch Davis is the real deal. It wouldn't be easy though, because after learning that Brown's owner, Al Lerner, was diagnosed with brain cancer, that would definitely complicate things because he really was the main voice in that room and being away from the team would kind of leave everybody a little bit disorganized at the very least. And I say disorganized in the front office room because I, I'm trying to explain what the hell happened in the 2002 NFL draft, okay? Because it was another 
tumultuous one in Cleveland. The player that they drafted 16th overall was a running back named William Green out of Boston College, and you can read more on his backstory if you want to, because he was a great running back in college, it's just the dude came from a really tragic upbringing. Both of his parents passed away early on in his life, but the Browns felt confident that he could stay out of trouble. And watched as Ed Reed. Have you, you heard of that guy? He was he was pretty good at football for a little bit, and he was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens eight picks later. But I mean, come on, they don't they don't need Ed Reed. And now it was finally time to begin the 2002 NFL season. Just not with Tim Couch, because he got injured in a preseason game versus the Packers, which means that Kelly Holcomb, a little-known quarterback, would become the fifth starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns in this new expansion era thing, so... Actually, believe it or not, this guy's gonna be pretty important, so he's not gonna go over here. Yeah, he's even getting highlighted. Seriously, this th know this guy, okay? He's he's lore relevant. You got those notes down, class? All right, cool, cool. So it's it's week one, the first game of the 2002 NFL season. In other words. This was an opportunity for the Cleveland Browns to prove themselves, as their opponent was the Kansas City Chiefs, a team on the cusp of a breakout led by Dick Vermeil, Priest Holmes, and their ridiculous O-line. And the game was actually a shootout, and Cleveland was keeping up even without Tim Couch. And keeping up was not all they did, because after Phil Dawson, pretty much the only good player from the original 1999 team, knocked down a 41-yard field goal, the Browns held a lead. 39 to 37, and with 30 seconds left on the clock and no timeouts, the Chiefs were absolutely done. Except they got a taunting penalty. The penalty was on the holder! Even though it was later said that Phil Dawson was the one taunting, I mean, does that make it any better? But it didn't really matter, because all the defense had to do was literally just stand there, and what resulted was one of the most confusing sequences in NFL history, where big man John Tate, the Chiefs tackle, ends up with the ball and rumbles forward, but it wasn't enough, game over, and... And then, Dwayne Rudd, a Browns linebacker, just lobs his helmet off into the middle of the field, mid-play. And because of the effort by the fat guy, the Chiefs just had to kick a 30-yard field goal for the win, and the announcers are losing it, Morton Anderson kicks it in, and wins it for the Chiefs, Browns lose, f*** me, what a collapse. Ironically though, despite the tragedy, Tim Couch would start the rest of the regular season for Cleveland, and off of the back of his very solid game manager play, the Browns were a solid team, but nothing special, as after a loss to the Steelers, the Browns sat at just a 4-5 and five record and were on track for another 7-9 season. But then, something changed. Remember William Green, who I was talking about? I basically set him up to be a bust, but... The dude had something in him. The man was just a monster when it mattered most, and throughout the second half of the season, the dude proved he might be the next best running back in the NFL and went ballistic, putting the Cleveland Browns on his back for the entire season. He's done everything that he's asked. As he started the first two games, Green inside the 10, inside the 5, to the end zone, touchdown! Oh my god! The, the Cleveland Browns? Having a good player that they actually drafted? Surely not, right? Well, and truth be told, from weeks 11 through 17, William Green burst onto the scene as a truly elite young running back, averaging 100 yards per game on a workhorse amount of carries, capping off his seven-game run with a masterclass, 178-yard domination to clinch the playoffs. For the first time in their new franchise's history, the Cleveland Browns were in the playoffs. You're probably wondering why I'm not like throwing shit all across the room and screaming because I usually do that when I get to these parts of the videos, but um, the reason why this didn't really matter too much was that Tim Couch was a massive casualty and the man was sacrificed to even get the Browns close to the playoffs in the first place. In the win versus Atlanta, when they got into the playoffs, Tim Couch <laughs> broke his leg because Browns fans were enjoying life sober for like nine minutes and would be out for the remainder of the playoffs. Meaning, even after doing his part, helping quarterback the Browns to the playoffs, Tim Couch would not be allowed to play in the tournament because his mental health was getting a little bit too stable. Not saying the road to the playoffs wasn't very rocky for Tim Couch, because fucking hell it was. In week five, Couch got a pretty bad concussion versus the Ravens, and according to him, he doesn't even remember all that much from the play, but he does remember vividly one thing, and that was lying on the ground injured, while the same fans he put his body and mind on the line for cheered as he lay down hurt. And Browns fans to this day still detest that they were cheering that Kelly Holcomb was coming in the game, and that's why 
why they were happy, but like, bro, I don't, I don't care how many Coors Lights you've downed before 11 a.m. Sometimes you just gotta read the room. Regardless of that little incident, the fans were granted their wish. Kelly Holcomb, a bad quarterback, would become their first ever playoff QB starter, and their opponent in the first round of the playoffs was the Pittsburgh Steelers, an organization that more often than not knows what they're doing. So let's, let's make this quick and wait a minute. Hold on! Well, shit. Th this is football at its absolute peak. A snowy field, hated division rivals going at it, and an underdog domination. Maybe Browns fans were actually right all along. Kelly Holcomb was pulverizing the Steelers' defense. But then it started happening. Reality started setting in, because the football gods wouldn't just let the Cleveland Browns' flesh prison get into the playoffs and win. No, absolutely the hell not. Remember, this is a comedy, okay? We're all here to laugh, even if you're a Browns fan or not. So with a chance to put the game away, the Browns have two pretty unlucky moments inside Pittsburgh's 10 where they miss out on a fumble chance and then on a tip ball, the Steelers score a touchdown. But Holcomb and Green were making plays and Cleveland scored a statement touchdown to retake the lead. And then after dropping an arm punt, they allowed a touchdown, which brings us to the biggest play of the game. Third down and 12. Kelly Holcomb and the Browns need a first down to keep the drive going and at the very least give their defense a rest. And although they've made some terrible plays in the past couple of minutes, they have a chance to redeem themselves. If they got the pick a few plays ago or the ball moved a different direction on the tip, they may be winning, but now is their time. So Kelly drops back and delivers a dime to Dennis Northcutt, who drops it. He drops. Anyway, believe it or not, but the Browns proceeded to completely fold, and the Steelers immediately went down the field and won the game 36-33, with the Cleveland Browns blowing a 24-7 lead in the wild card in their first ever playoff appearance. You see why I keep calling this a comedy? Kelly Holcomb. Kelly Holcomb set an NFL record at the time for passing yards in a wild card game in five degree weather with the fans building f snowman in the stands and they lost the game. But all they could do was keep moving forward, I guess. And with the unfortunate passing of Al Lerner, the upcoming 2003 season would be the first under new ownership. His son, R Randy Lerner, would take control of the reins. So that's that's fantastic. Now, with the coaching staying relatively similar, all eyes turn towards Project Fix Tim Couch, because at this point, Tim's NFL career was looking grim. But if he would have a career renaissance, it would come in 2003. Forget that the dude had too many concussions to even keep track of at this point, at the wise age of 25, and forget that from 1999 to 2003, Tim Couch was sacked fourth most among all QBs, despite playing less games than all three guys ahead of him, and forget that the man's confidence was gone. Literally just gone gone. So maybe Tim Couch was a lost asset, and the Browns kind of thought so too, to be honest with you. The whole save Tim Couch's career thing went up in flames immediately, when Kelly Holcomb won the starting quarterback battle going into 2003. But to his credit, Couch was a real professional about the whole thing, still talking to the media and being a good teammate. And that's the thing with Tim Couch. Talent was never really the biggest issue, but I do believe he never had like superstar potential like Donovan McNabb did have. But I feel like he could have been at the very most like an Alex Smith, Derek Carr type guy, but in Cleveland, that just was never really going to be realistic. Now, 2003 was here. Fun times were only ahead, right? No. No, it's time for some good old-fashioned Cleveland Browns tomfoolery, all right? It, it's about to get hog wild. So, Kelly Holcomb is the franchise guy now, right? Nope. <laughs> Fucker breaks his leg on a QB sneak. How? I couldn't tell you, but okay. At least they still have talent. R remember William Green, the running back who carried them before? He should keep developing. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. Dude decided to go for a cheeky little booze cruise while high and ended up getting suspended for a majority of the season. And for more fun and games, he cheated on his fiance and got f stabbed for it. Well, this is all mildly unfortunate, but at least they still have Kevin Johnson, who's logged 2,000 yard seasons with the team damn near, and uh, <laughs> never mind. He got cut. Why did he get cut, you may ask? Well, because his wife was the woman who William Green cheated on with. Alright, man, last one, okay? I swear, this is it. 
their only Pro Bowl slash All Pro level player they've ever had to this point was linebacker Jameer Miller. And the dude tore his Achilles in a preseason game on turf and never played football again. So, the Cleveland Browns, am I right? <laughs> you see why I made this video now? I, shit like this just casually happens from time to time. And with a combination of Kelly Holcomb and Tim Couch again, the Browns went 5-11, but more importantly, the 2004 season would bring the end of the Tim Couch experiment officially, as after trying out for a few other teams, injuries just made it impossible for him to even be a backup for a few years, and he never played in another game in the NFL again. Meanwhile, throughout all of this, Courtney Brown kept getting hurt, Gerard Warren was mid at best with an attitude, and William Green got shanked, and together, these four first round picks all officially failed with the Cleveland Browns in just a few seasons, and the funniest part is, is they all failed for different reasons. Tim Couch got his confidence destroyed instantly, Courtney Brown kept getting hurt, Warren's ego was just too big, and William Green could never escape his demons. So seemingly no matter what the Browns did in the draft, it was just destined to go wrong. Whoever had the misfortune to go to Cleveland was never going to reach their full potential. And I mean, let's not, let's not look past that. The Browns just had a bonkers 2003 campaign, so entering the 2004 NFL Draft, this seemed like the perfect situation to go with a quarterback, right? I mean, Tim Couch is out, they need another guy, and yes, Eli Manning and Phillip Rivers were gonna be off the table, but Ben Roethlisberger, Captain Fat Fuck, would have fallen right into their laps, and all they had to do was sit there unconsciously and wait. And the Browns front office even had him ranked as the second overall player on their draft, with mock drafts also agreeing completely with their logic. So with the sixth overall pick, the Cleveland Browns decided to take the calm and collected, level-headed... Oh. Oh no. Um, if you know, you know. And if, if you don't know, please do not Google what uh, Kellen Winslow did later in his life. You you will know eventually though, but uh, wow, okay. I, I guess the Browns aren't going quarterback in the draft and instead went all in on another former piece of the 49ers, signing quarterback Jeff Garcia to a four year, $25 million contract to be their next franchise quarterback even before the draft began. For those of you who've never heard of Jeff Garcia before, I can't, I can't blame you. He was pretty solid for the Niners for a little bit there, but in Cleveland he did absolutely nothing. But he was announced as the sixth starting quarterback in Browns history, so let's do it. Jeff Garcia. Unfortunately for Jeffrey, he didn't last too long on the job. It seems like nobody really can, though, behind a still terrible O-line, and the season as a whole just ended entirely in Week 2, when the Browns lost to the Cowboys in a tight matchup, 12-19, but Jeff Garcia, their shiny new sacrificial token, went 8 for 27 for 71 yards, zero touchdowns, and three picks. And to make matters worse, their first round pick, Kellen Winslow, would also just snap his leg in his second game ever in the final six seconds on an onside kick. Nice. I mean, if it weren't for this whole quarterbacking thing going on, I would probably just skip the entire season. But eventually Jeff Garcia got hurt and Luke McCown, yes, the brother of Josh McCown, would become the seventh starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. And like Garcia, this, this dude doesn't don't even think about him after I write his name down. He's going down here, too. You're never going to see this dude's name again. The disrespect, I know. I'm literally covering him, but the dude is irrelevant. And when the lesser McCown took the field, all 18.2 Browns fans that tuned in lost a good portion of their stomach acid because whatever was left in there was just vomited out. I McCown and the Cleveland Browns, okay? They lost this game 37-7. to And McCown was terrible, as you could have probably expected, but... Just how bad was he? Well, since the year 1990, no NFL team has ever gained less all-purpose yards in a single game than the Cleveland Browns did on that very day when Luke McCown played against the Buffalo Bills. And to this very moment, they hold the record comfortably. I just don't understand how Browns fans do it. And even before this game began, Butch Davis was fired, which was going to happen after the season ended anyway, but when the Browns logged yet another uninspiring double-digit loss season going 4-12, and just when the fly of despair seemed endless, the Browns made the only decision they really could have, and it turned out to be the right one. They cleaned house completely, bringing in Romeo Cronell to be the head coach and Phil Savage to be the general manager, and thus, a new era was born. I love this town. 
This new regime had all the opportunity in the world to build a powerhouse from nothing if they played their cards carefully, so they started out by throwing Jeff Garcia overboard and then made an okay draft selection being very nice when they took Braylon Edwards third overall, and he's also a player that comes with a f ton of baggage, but as you'll see, he'll prove to be better than Courtney Brown was at least, and a transaction that went completely under the radar at the time was the signing of undrafted rookie Josh Cribbs to the roster, one of the greatest special teams players ever. But this team was still a long ways away from being competitive, and without a franchise quarterback, nobody's gonna take you seriously, and with Jeff Garcia and Holcomb gone to Detroit and Buffalo, that made room for the 33-year-old Super Bowl winning quarterback Trent Dilfer to start as the 8th quarterback for them, and a rookie third round quarterback Charlie Fry would fill in for 5 starts too, with mixed results becoming the ninth quarterback. So let me... Let me draw these two guys, too. Actually, Charlie Fry isn't completely useless to know, but um, I honestly wrote the script, and I forgot that Trent Dilfer played for the Browns. Well, I spelled his name wrong. But it is what it is. The season under Trent Dilfer and Charlie Fry did not go well. But like I said, the Browns were moving in the right direction. It's just this roster had too many issues. The Browns had an awkward running back room that now seemed to be taken over completely by newcomer Ruben Drowns, who ran for 1,200 yards, and the defense was still a barren wasteland, as the Browns won six games and were just waiting for their time to strike, because it sure as hell was not now. It's just, it's a real shame that Kellen Winslow, who missed almost the entire 2004 season, also missed the whole 2005 season because his tire was shot by an onlooking sniper and tore his ACL doing that little motorcycle thing. But as long as the guy can stay out of trouble in the future and not have any controversies outside of Cleveland even too, it should be fine. And, you know, maybe the Browns have a chance at, at changing destiny. Look, dude, I I'm just trying to be positive here, okay? Yeah, no positives here. Uh, prepare to be enlightened on the most hilarious, literally the best form of ironic torture directed at the Cleveland Browns ever. So, before 2006, they finally landed a massive free agent, and his name was LaCharles Bentley. The two-time Pro Bowl center for the Saints signed a six-year, $36 million deal to become a Cleveland Brown. Now, Bentley was regarded as, at the time, the best free agent on the market, and how he ended up in Cleveland was basically because he was from there. Born and raised in Cleveland and played at Ohio State, all Bentley wanted to do during his entire life was play football for the Cleveland Browns organization, and I'm sure you can tell what I'm setting up here, but I'm not even trying to be dramatic, I, I swear. Dude did it to himself. He said, and I quote, I can die happy now, and that he fulfilled one of his life goals just by being a Cleveland Brown. So, do you think that the football gods took this unwarranted happiness kindly in Cleveland? F no, they didn't. And so, the eighth plague was brought upon the Browns facility, gifting multiple players with a nice staph infection, which is basically why people are told to keep their wounds clean at all times and away from bacteria, but Cleveland's dirty-ass medical team apparently didn't get the memo, and one of the players infected was LaCharles Bentley. To add injury to insult to injury, I guess, he got the infection after tearing his patella tendon in the first play of the first scrimmage of practice. So, not only was he out for the season regardless, but his staph infection would become so bad that he almost had to get his leg straight up cut off. I mean, amputation is not a word that's just thrown around in medical fields. And just like that, the career of one of the best free agents the Browns ever signed, a man who just wanted to play for his hometown team and nothing else, would end, and the guy would never play another snap in the NFL after 2005, never suiting up for the Cleveland Browns even once. Well played, Cleveland. Well done. And with that, this led to a complete relapse in 2006 for them. First round pick Braylon Edwards' potential was all sucked up and spit out in seemingly one season, as he was fighting teammates and arguing with coaches and whatnot, and Charlie Fry started most of the year, but... <laughs> but there was one more man who saw some action, and his name is Derek Anderson, who you may have heard of as a journeyman backup for a while, but in his rookie season in 2006, he showed, I guess, minor flashes of what he could possibly be capable of, so just something to keep in mind, but the point is that Derek Anderson became the 10th starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns, and, you know, maybe you want to pay attention to this, some very obvious foreshadowing, but Derek Anderson is going to get a picture of himself. He's, he's, he's important. That looks pretty, pretty nice. Bring it a little closer. Uh, see this masterpiece? Yeah, look at that. 
that's 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 Derek Anderson, pretty much pixel for pixel, I'd say. So yeah, you know how it is. The Browns won four games, but somehow Browns fans just didn't care. They kept coming to games no matter what. They continued buying tickets and didn't stop rooting for whatever no-name quarterback was back there. And for all their years of being POWs to their own organization that was forged from greed, the, the Browns owed them one good year, right? Just one and no bull but they actually got that in 2007. And it all started with one guy, one draft pick that just for a moment seemed like everything was going to be perfect in the future for the Cleveland Browns. With the third overall pick in the 2007 draft, the Cleveland Browns took Wisconsin lineman Joe Thomas. And they knew instantly the guy was going to be a monster in the NFL because on draft day, he didn't even watch the draft. The Chad was just having a fishing trip when he got the call to come to Cleveland. And in just his rookie season, he would go on to form a one-man wall on the O-line and would eventually blossom into arguably the greatest offensive lineman of all time. So with a player of that stature coming to Cleveland, the football gods needed to balance that out, right? And by trading a second round pick and a future first round pick to go get themselves a franchise quarterback in Brady Quinn, which honestly, at the time, seemed like a great move for reasons unexplained in the moment. For the value, this was an amazing pick. Hell, there were even mock drafts out there where Cleveland took Brady Quinn third overall instead of Joe Thomas. Jesus, man. C can you imagine that dark timeline? W what if they didn't have Joe Thomas? Uh, no, we're not plunging into hypotheticals yet. I, I won't do that to you, Browns fans. But one more thing to mention before we get into the regular season is that they signed the elder Jamal Lewis, an amazing running back in his prime, but the dude was 28 years old now, which in running back years is primordial. But the dude was the Brown killer in the past, literally predicting he would break the single game rushing record at the time versus Cleveland before, and then, you know, did. So, so might as well see how good he'll do fighting for the enemy. And now, here we are. No new quarterback news to report on, as Derek Anderson pretty much started the whole year, and week one, the Browns got, you know, fucking throttled. But okay, after that game, from weeks two through nine, I would say quite possibly, we bared witness to the biggest quarterback anomaly ever. Like, we're talking Lynn Sanity levels of just absurdness, and Derek Anderson, Derek motherfucking Anderson, became a real legitimate MVP candidate. Anderson got laid out by Rodney Harrison and still threw a touchdown pass. Anderson throws, it's caught by Vickers, touchdown! We'll get to his stats and how this was happening in a few seconds, but do you know how astronomical the odds were that this was even happening? So much had to go perfectly right for Derek Anderson for him to even have a chance at becoming great, because before the season began, it looked like this was Brady Quinn's job easily. I mean, he was a first-round pick that they just gave up damn near an entire draft for, and the dude was coming into the league as a 23-year-old quarterback. But then there were holdout issues from his camp, and because of that, Brady Quinn basically lost his ticket in the Browns' starting quarterback quarterback lottery. And head coach Romeo Cornell then looked at Charlie Fry and Derek Anderson, the two guys left and said, well, sh sh I don't know what to do here. What, what am I, a head coach? So let's let's figure this out like men, okay? Let's have a f***ing coin toss to see who gets the starting QB job. That, that'll, that'll be great for the team, right? And, <laughs> and so Charlie Fry then actually won the coin toss, but in week one, he was benched after not even two quarters of play. And two days after that loss, Charlie Fry was straight up traded away to Seattle, leaving Derek Anderson all alone, and now he was the starting quarterback for the Browns. What the fuck? C could you imagine if your team gave away the starting quarterback job to some dude just because he won a coin toss and then decided to trade him days after his first start? Once again, only the Cleveland Browns. But this actually ended up working. And like I said, Derek Anderson from weeks two through nine had an MVP case. It's hard to see narratives from back then because I don't have a fucking MySpace account, but the man was throwing for 275 yards per game over two touchdowns and had a quarterback rating of near 100. And this was highlighted by a monster performance in his first ever start this season, where he threw for five touchdowns and tied the record for the most touchdowns by a Browns quarterback in any game ever. And Derek Anderson did end up cooling off as the year went on, but not by as much as you'd think. And for the first time in the new Browns history, talent existed and was able to carry the Browns all year long when Derek Anderson couldn't. And like I said, Jamal Lewis was here and was very productive, but also 
Braylon Edwards, yeah, and the former third overall pick had an outstanding season. Like, actually, just look at this man's highlights this season. 2007 Braylon Edwards was one of the best single season receivers of the last 20 years. Not like top 10 or anything crazy like that, but he was really good. And the reason his impressive 16 touchdown reign of terror is never discussed is one, he played for the Cleveland Browns, and two, Randy Moss existed this season and did things with Thomas. So, yeah, pr pretty unfortunate. And with this Browns team finally coming together, they went into week 16 with a 9-5 and five record. And if they took down the five-win Bengals, a division rival, they would all but clinch the playoffs. <sighs> they did not. They lost the game. But luckily, I, I guess, all they needed to have happen for the Cleveland Browns to return to the playoffs was for the Indianapolis Colts, a team that had 13 wins and was one of the best units Peyton Manning ever had, to simply take down the Tennessee Titans in the final week of the season on Sunday Night Football. <sighs> they did not. The Colts chose to rest their starters in just the second quarter. Without Peyton Manning, the Tennessee Titans won the game 16-10 and advanced to the playoffs, while the Cleveland Browns, with their best record since their 1999 return to the league, missed the playoffs. It's just hilarious. The one time the Browns are actually good, they still can't escape themselves. Just, just listen to this, okay? Before 2007, the Browns only had one Pro Bowler ever since 1999, and that man was Jameer Miller, who I talked about earlier, but in 2007 alone, the Cleveland Browns had six Pro Bowlers. Joe Thomas, Kellen Winslow, Derek Anderson, Braylon Edwards, Josh Cribbs, and even the long snapper Ryan Pompbrand all made it to the Pro Bowl. That's damn near five guys on offense alone, and they didn't even make the playoffs. <gasps> this f***ing team, man. I mean, I wrote the script, and it's still just a marvel of science how this shit keeps happening to them. And with this one unfortunate season, an avalanche would fall on them in 2008. And with deep playoff run expectations, they bolster those expectations, maybe, by bringing in defensive tackle Corey Williams, who's like the ninth Corey Williams to pop up when you search his name up, and Dante Stallworth, a productive piece of the 2007 Patriots team who, trust me, will be mentioned after the season concludes. The man did something absolutely unforgivable. And they needed Dante to be productive as a receiver too. Joe Jarovicius, one of their most reliable receivers, got a staph infection and eventually had a crazy lawsuit with the Browns, so he would never play football again and somebody needed to catch passes, but that just didn't happen. And instead, this year was just plagued by injuries to everybody. Super villain Kellen Winslow had a weird thing going on with <laughs> Believe it or not, a staff infection and a suspension by his own owner, Derek Anderson regressed significantly and tore his knee ligament, to which Browns fans cheered again. Then their franchise quarterback, Brady Quinn, broke his finger in Week 12 and missed the season, and just way too many more injuries happened to get into. But worst of all, Braylon Edwards was actually healthy. I, I mean, no doubt in my mind the team would have been better with him in the infirmary, because the man could not catch anything this season, and his 2007 flash in the pan year would go down as one of the biggest one-season wonders by any player ever. Just an unbelievable number of catastrophes happening one after the other, but hey, for the purpose of this video, I mean, we love to see that. And in 2008, the Browns would start four different quarterbacks, Derek Anderson being one of them, but Brady Quinn also made his first start, becoming the 11th quarterback, then Ken Dorsey, Yes, the Ken Dorsey, who was the offensive coordinator for the Bills, and ironically is now the coordinator for the Browns, became the 12th QB, and then Bruce Gronkowski finished the year off with Ken Dorsey injured in weeks 16 and 17, becoming the 13th quarterback. So, time to draw more names. Brady Quinn, you know, decently important, but not important enough to get a face, and Ken Dorsey and Bruce Gron... Uh, what's, his, what's his name again? Bruce Gronkowski. Yeah, he's... He's a nobody. I mean, if you love terrible football, watch some 2008 Browns highlights, okay? They, they are packed full of joy. And this fun year ended with a six-game losing streak, a 31-0 loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers, Ken Dorsey playing one of the worst professional football games a human can ever even accidentally play, and the Browns finished the season going 4-12, and and now it was time for another new era to begin in Cleveland. And more and more by the year, it seemed like Romeo Cornell's words in this press conference just continued to ring truer and truer. Basically, in 99, started over, right? Uh, and then two years after that, uh, in 2001, it started over. Uh, and, and then, what, four years after that, it started over. 
Even if Romeo was right, th that doesn't mean his job was safe though, and same goes for Phil Savage, as both of them were canned prior to 2009, and an entire new regime would take over. Literally, everybody was new. Mike Keenan would be the president, Brian Dable the offensive coordinator, Rob Ryan the defensive coordinator, Eric Mangini the Belichick apprentice, uh, sort of, would become the head coach, and George Kokinas, a man with my favorite story in NFL history, would be hired as the general manager, and there was actually belief amongst Browns fans at the time that the team was gonna turn over a new leaf. But before we get into Georgia's story, the roster needed to be addressed immediately, because the quarterback room in particular was on life support. Derek Anderson was still here, but he's really bad, and Brady Quinn was also still here, except he's been dealing with injuries, and even when he's been on the field, the guy hasn't showed any flashes of being an acceptable backup. And the weapons Cleveland even had to work with were just gone! R remember Dante Stallworth, the guy who was supposed to rub his Patriots magic off on the other men? I uh, the point is, he, he killed the guy. Yeah, it's honestly f***ing horrible, but Dante Stallworth was clubbing late at night and struck a man with his car, killing him. And the most f***ed up part about this entire situation is he actually continued playing in the NFL after literally murdering somebody. Average Browns moment there, and Braylon Edwards is also just bad now, punching guys on the field and, I guess, LeBron's friend off the field, so now he became a top three most wanted man in Cleveland with a few haymakers, and that then was... And he was traded to the Jets. Cool. But it wasn't all doom and gloom, okay? There were some bright spots. Josh Cribbs was great during all of this and was about to have his best special team season ever in 2009. And George Kokinas and company just used their first first round pick since 2007 to draft Alex Mack, a future Pro Bowl center for them, and traded away their future... Uh, a very, very troubled tight end, Kellen Winslow Jr., for a second round pick, who would later turn out to be wide receiver Muhammad Masako. So, you know, hopefully George's time in Cleveland won't turn out as stinky as the others before him. But with Brady Quinn and Derek Anderson being the only two men in the quarterback room, what happened in 2009 shouldn't be surprising to anybody, because... Brady Quinn started the first three games, then got benched for being bad, then Derek Anderson started the next couple of games and got benched for being worse, and then they traded back and forth for the rest of the season, once again leading this team to another double-digit loss campaign going 5-11. and 11. This is maybe the Browns' lowest point ever, okay? I mean, dude, just, just look at this board here. I mean, you probably can't see it all, but... All those names have all amounted to zero success, just one playoff collapse, and that's not even counting all the busts they've had. Courtney Brown, Gerard Warren, William Green, and the list goes on and on. It's just, it truly can't get worse than, than, than this. And then the George Kokinas thing would happen. To this day, due to legal reasons, nobody seemingly can ever say what happened to George Kokinas during his time with the Cleveland Browns. And I know I'm acting like the Browns just killed the man and hid his body in the stadium somewhere, but seriously, there has never been a more mysterious departure of any general manager in the modern era, because after not even a year after becoming the GM and seemingly not doing a terrible job, the Browns fired George Kokinas, and the only true evidence that we have about why was that Kokinas was allegedly seen getting dragged out of the facility by Brown security. So, something really bad must have happened. It's sad that the duo of Eric Mangini and George Kokinas, known as Mancock, barely lasted a few months, but the strap on, the strap in, because the theories surrounding Kokinas' departure get f preposterous, okay? So, there are basically three plausible explanations for him being fired. First is he made bad transactional decisions and butted heads with other executives executives, which honestly not only is the most boring answer, but also seems pretty unlikely given he didn't even have a full year to prove himself. And then the second reason, he had a massive drug problem, allegedly, and became increasingly unreliable to the point of no return, which to me also seems very unlikely because the dude has three children and a wife, and has never had any history with substance abuse in the public, and finally, the third reason, and the one in my mind, I believe to be canon in Cleveland Browns lore, is he had an affair with the team's female salary cap expert, got caught, shit on his boss's desk after they found out and fired him, and pissed on the Browns' wall of fame before being dragged off by security. Yeah, I'm not lying. Uh, not even being a little bit dramatic. Didn't make any of that up. There is a real chance that all of those events took place. God, I love the Cleveland Browns. Uh, that's a sentence that I just reeled off to you, and it mildly makes sense only because we're talking about the Cleveland Browns. Any other team, other than the Raiders, and you'd call bull**t, 
okay? But, but not here. And there is actually evidence supporting this last theory. Along with Coquinas getting fired, the salary cap expert, who couldn't resist the Coquinas apparently, uh, went along with him. She was fired as well. And as for unleashing his demonic wrath upon his boss's desk, although people involved with the situation can't legally say anything, as I said, little hints were given to us about what might have happened by Joe Thomas, who seems like a reliable source to me, and others in the future, which helps put this whole puzzle together. So you got that? Alright, cool. Brown's GM is gone after f***ing his co-worker and sh**ing on his boss's desk after a loss to the Bears in just week 8. And like I said, the Browns went 5-11 and and needed another general manager, so they got one, uh, hiring Tom Heckert. At this point, there's barely even a point in me mentioning all these GMs and whatnot, because no matter what happens, even if they do well apparently, they're going to be gone in two seasons bare minimum. But hey, for, for what it's worth, Tom's first draft turned out actually amazing. This was one of their best drafts they've had in franchise history outside of the Joe Thomas draft, where they took future Pro Bowl corner Joe Hayden and Pro Bowl safety TJ Ward, as well as taking a stab at a quarterback prospect with Texas's Colt McCoy in the third round. Not that it's a great pick or anything, but gotta mention him. They did trade pretty much their only good defensive player before that draft, Cameron Wimbley, for literally nothing, and then did the same with another failed franchise quarterback with Brady Quinn, but ah, whatever, it's just another Browns moment. And in the 2010 offseason, the greatest quarterback in competition probably ever would occur. Which of these three distinguished gentlemen would have the honor of receiving substantial and irreversible damage to their mental healths? Seneca Wallace, who sucks, Jake DeLome, who used to not suck, but now sucks, and Colt McCoy, who was a decade younger than DeLome, and eventually it would be revealed he also sucks. Yes, I'm not bullshitting you. Jake DeLome actually played quarterback in the 2010s. It was it was news to me, and probably is to you. And, you know, turns out, they all won the quarterback competition. Uh, DeLome won it instantly, but throughout the season, all three dudes would get a chance to start. Uh, DeLome becoming the 14th quarterback, Seneca Wallace the 15th, and Colt McCoy the 16th. So, gotta do the thing again. I kinda screwed up the Y a little bit on Colt McCoy's name, but... I, I I, could care less. The 2010 and 2011 season for the Cleveland Browns can sort of be summed up together by one word. Why? <laughs> their record over this two-year stretch doesn't even equate to their best record in franchise history at the time when they won 10 games and missed the playoffs. It's... It's just amazing how they keep f***ing everything up, too. It's been, it's been mind-numbing. And all this time, they've been wasting the career of Joe Thomas, who's been racking up all pro teams, and at the end of 2011, they decided, you know what? Well, we don't need a wide receiver. We're all set with f***ing Greg Little as the wide receiver one, and <laughs> traded away their first-round pick that would become Julio f***ing Jones to the Atlanta Falcons. This is too much, man. I need... Jesus, I, I need a beer or something. But then, finally, when it looked like Browns fans were about to collectively organize a mass suit after the Ravens won another Super Bowl, positive or negative, things were going to change again. The value of the Browns as an organization, believe it or not, wasn't actually increasing. And so finally, the Browns were free of the learner's rule. When another rich old guy with a lot of money by the name of Jimmy Haslam, a man with his own uh, <laughs> legal uh, issues, purchased the Cleveland Browns franchise for a billion buckaroos. Man, that is a lot of money. So now the Cleveland Browns went into the 2012 season, and more specifically the 2012 NFL Draft, the same way they went into 2007, where they had two first round picks this time and had a chance at a legacy draft. And with those two picks, they should walk away with at least one cornerstone for the future, the same way they did with Joe Thomas. And Tom Heckert, the GM, took over this draft and instantly changed the Browns organization forever. I am lying to you. No, he fucking didn't. <laughs> The Browns decided to draft Trent Richardson third overall, who turned out to be actually pretty similar to William Green, in the sense of he had all the athletic abilities in the world to be great, but, um, well, I guess he didn't get stabbed, but he didn't have the brain power. And arguably, a worse pick came later in that same first round when they selected Oklahoma State quarterback Brandon Whedon, who on paper seemed like a pretty interesting prospect. He had a lot of good qualities and bad ones too, but, um... The man was 28 years old. 
28 years old. A decision their future general manager, Michael Lombardi, would later call a panic disaster. And with Brandon Whedon being drafted as the next savior of Cleveland, he became the 17th starting quarterback they would have. So, board time. Oh, it's, 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 it's getting to the point where you can't even see it anymore. Brandon Whedon, the Browns' new supposed franchise quarterback, was already older than Aaron F Rodgers was, and he was drafted in 2005. But maybe come week one, uh, Whedon's greatest asset, his NFL readiness, would be put on full display for the entire world to see, and before his first game even began, the motherfucker got engulfed by the flag. Oh, I love the Browns so much. But the Browns weren't done browning on this very day, because Brandon Whedon, at 28 years old, had one of the worst quarterbacking performances in NFL history. <laughs> Bro, fucking five? They lost the game by one point, and my man had four picks and a passer rating of fucking 5.1. So... <laughs> Brandon Whedon's stardom was already evaporated instantaneously, but that didn't mean he wasn't going to play for damn near the whole season, starting 15 games for the Browns in 2012, only mustering one performance over a 100 passer rating. But Brandon Whedon and Trent Richardson both got injured before the last game of the season, meaning that fellow rookie quarterback, who was, all <laughs> who was also 27 years old, Thad Lewis, yeah, uh, Thad Lewis, real guy, not an auto-generated dude, would become the 18th quarterback to start for Cleveland, and I swear to God, I'm never going to mention this man's name again. D honestly, he doesn't even deserve to be put on the board, but I'm going to do it anyways. 2013 would involve more of the same, and by season's end, the team went through another coach, and for the sixth season in a row, won either four or five games. Just... Can you imagine being a fan of this team and a six-win season would have been your best in seven years? And let's just appreciate this mastery, complete mastery of being shit that the Browns have achieved. They've gone through more coaches during this time period, but uh, the one thing I'm going to mention is the two new quarterbacks we got from this, this little time skip. Uh, Brian Hoyer would become the 19th and Jason Campbell, the 20th quarterback. Yeah, the... Uh, the Washington Jason Campbell. He actually played for the Browns for a little bit. And we're, we're not done with Brian Hoyer yet either. Uh, I'm actually going to underline his name so you don't forget him. You know what? Actually, screw that. I'm, dr I'm drawing a picture of him. I think I've outdone myself. I think this is the best drawing I've had. Hold on. Let me, let me bring it closer. Look at, look at that beauty. Look at that. <sighs> All right. So... Although it looked like the Browns were doing more Browns shenanigans, under another new regime, they were making some better moves than usual, I guess. Josh Gordon, who they actually picked up in the 2013 supplemental draft, burst onto the scene despite his quarterback play, similar to Braylon Edwards, and literally became a top five wide receiver in the league. And Trent Richardson, who remember was an absolute bust outside of a touchdown heavy rookie season, was traded away for a first round pick somehow. But this is where things get real fun, okay? First, I gotta flash the whole new coaching staff on the screen here for just a second so you know, and most notably, Kyle Shanahan was here now, and once again, the process repeats itself. This new Browns management needed, absolutely needed, to leave this next draft with something to help them in the future, and famously, to make sure they made analytically the best decision possible they hired a team of experts and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to make a hundred percent certain they had a guaranteed quarterback of the future, and the study told them, take Teddy Bridgewater in the draft. Do you think they listened? No. No, no, no they fucking didn't. It turns out, the sexual uh, pressure of Johnny Manziel was just too powerful, and... <laughs> <laughs> Although the data said plain and simple to draft Teddy Bridgewater, who turned out to be very good before his injuries, they wanted Billy Vegas and drafted Johnny Manziel 22nd overall with their pick from the Trent Richardson trade, and for one more sledgehammer shot to the fucking balls, the next three quarterbacks off the board were Teddy Bridgewater, Derek Carr, and Jimmy G, so <laughs> they, they could have gotten more value out of their 100k if they had just signed like one of the worst kickers in the league. Wait, and most people know about that whole research group they hired, but what isn't as well known is... <sighs> this is a thing, okay? I didn't just make this up, I swear. Jimmy Haslam, 
The owner of this multi-billion dollar company said a homeless man convinced him to draft Johnny Manziel. This f***ing guy who is in charge of operating an NFL football team chose to trust a crackhead over his own team. I, did you see why this video needed to be made at this point? This sh is nuts. So, so anyway, Johnny Football stole all the attention, and rightfully so, but there are two other guys in this draft that honestly had their impacts felt way more in Cleveland, for very different reasons, as the Cleveland Browns selected corner Justin Gilbert 8th overall, who will develop impressively into probably their worst draft pick ever, just in terms of actual talent, but in the second round, they selected future All-Pro guard Joel Batonio, a man who will be a massive piece on a future god-tier O-line. But at its core, this is still a quarterback video, so yes, we have to look at the legendary quarterback battle between Johnny Manziel and Hoyer the Destroyer. <laughs> uh, somewhere there's symbolism here for this entire f pathetic organization, but neither of us want to rip up an old scab right now, and in the end, the Hoyer emerged victorious. But because his ass is already on the board, I don't have to write him down, and with Josh Gordon suspended for the entire season, it's gonna be a gonna be a running theme from here on out. Uh, come on, we know how this is gonna go. Brian Hoyer's gonna play like two games and then he's gonna get benched and Johnny Manziel's gonna go in there and get sent to the gulag. But no, didn't happen. Actually, Brian Hoyer and the Cleveland Browns started off playing very well and kept that momentum going, becoming a good NFL team. Lesson one of NFL football, do not feed the Hoyer. I, I mean, the dude was quietly really, really solid, leading the Browns to a 7-4 record, and a lot of their improved play can be credited to Kyle Shanahan and his family's inhuman ability to turn any quarterback into a Pro Bowl-level guy. But there were also a lot, a f***ing lot of negatives during this time. Justin Gilbert, their first-round pick before Manziel, wasn't even good enough to win the starting job, and constantly was buried even further on the depth chart for being a sleepy boy a little bit too often. So yeah, add that first round pick to the list that just has begun to overflow of bust. And on the field, this Browns team was one more bad thing happening from just everything completely imploding. Their Pro Bowl center Alex Mack suffered one of the most disgusting injuries I've ever seen, and their GM was sending illegal text messages, so this, you know, this was all routine Brown stuff. But then, it happened. Brian Hoyer unfortunately started playing like normal Brian Hoyer. Over his next two games after a win over the Falcons, the man lost his destroyer title completely, averaging 160 yards and two picks, and then the Browns had seen enough. And it was time. Johnny Manziel was announced as the starter for a week 15 game versus the Cincinnati Bengals, and at 7-6, and six, this game against Cincy would literally decide how the season would end, and obviously Johnny Manziel would become the 21st starting quarterback in this new age for Cleveland. He's gonna get a picture of himself too. Okay, I'm done, and I know it doesn't- hold on, let me- <laughs> let me bring it closer. I know it doesn't- it doesn't look like him right now, because, you know, you can see he doesn't have a mustache, but it'll all make sense in a second, okay? This is- this is Johnny incognito mode. So now the question was, could Johnny Football save the Cleveland Browns season and pull off a miracle? No. <laughs> no, he couldn't. And in classic Browns fashion, this game went worse than anyone could have possibly envisioned. Manziel was not only put in the most high-stress situation possible and responded horribly against a very mediocre Bengals defense, but after Andy Dalton had the worst game any quarterback would have all year versus the Browns a few weeks prior, Johnny Manziel gave him a pretty good scare for taking that title away, having the second lowest passer rating in a game in 2014, going for a blistering 80 yards and two picks, as the Browns lost the game 30 to zero. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cleveland Browns have done it again. They proceeded to lose every game left on their schedule, and just because Connor Shaw, a man who literally damn near doesn't have a pro football reference page, would become the 22nd starting quarterback. And I, I know I, I've said this before, and I'm gonna keep saying it, but th this dude holds zero value to you, but he's going on that board. The 2015 offseason mainly brought in a huge overhaul to the wide receiver room with fucking 
Dwayne Bowe and Brian Hartline. And although Dwayne Bowe would be the headline signing, he would go on to catch five passes as a member of the Cleveland Browns, ever. And meanwhile, Brian Hartline and their Pro Bowl tight end Gary Barnage would actually be pretty good assets to work with if the Browns actually knew who their quarterback was going to be, because um, they didn't. And Josh Gordon was also suspended for the entire season, and the offense had a bit more problems than that coming their way. As said, Kyle Shanahan was able to magically edit the DNA technology of Brian Hoyer's body and made him a passable quarterback for a few games. So it was crucial to keep him on board, Kyle Shanahan, that is, not, not, not Brian Hoyer, and maybe give him a head coaching job in a year or two. I don't know, cra crazy statement, right? <laughs> If only, right? Instead, Kyle Shanahan wanted out of Cleveland immediately. He, he saw no future with the Browns organization, which, you know, he was right about, and handed head coach Mike Patine a document containing 32 different points explaining why he thinks the Browns are a lawless dumpster fire. And in return, the Browns allowed him to resign, and Kyle would then go on to build the Falcons into one of the best losers of all time. Anyway, who's ready for another quarterback battle, as Johnny Manziel versus Josh McCown would be a real thing with Brian Hoyer gone in Houston, and Johnny Manziel was so f***ing terrible that he lost the battle to Josh McCown, as he became the 23rd quarterback, and let's, let's get this over with. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh McCown. Unfortunately, though, Josh McCown got injured right away, so there goes the franchise, and him and Johnny Manziel would then split time for most of the season with Austin Davis starting two games near the end of the season, becoming the 24th starting quarterback. And I'll put him on the board eventually, okay? Just, I don't feel like doing it right now. Besides that, it was the usual. More horrible play, another no-name quarterback. And this season, though, was actually the calm before the fucking genocidal cyclone, even with it being that boring and forgettable. They did lose to the Ravens on a block field goal because Browns, just Ooh. Gilbert crashed his car because Browns, and most importantly, Cleveland only won three games, a complete 180 from last year, and because of his failure, no. Mike Patin was fired as head coach, and the darkness, it swallows us all, because the greatest villain the Browns have had since Art Modell would come here and cement himself, and you probably already know who I'm talking about. Hell, if you know anything about football since 2017, 16, it's time for the dark ages of the Cleveland Browns to officially begin. You think it's already bad? Well, I'm about to show you, it can still get so much worse. The Hugh Jackson era has begun, and things are about to get f***ing depressing. And with that, it seems like this is a great time to mention Josh Gordon's annual year-long suspension. And then, in the 2016 NFL Draft, the Browns grew impatient with Josh's uh, self-imposed obstacles and traded away the rights to Carson Wentz and felt like they really just needed a wide receiver more and drafted Corey Coleman. I mean... This is nearing a statistical anomaly at this point as to how many first round picks they've thrown into the fucking sewer. I know I said the 2000 Browns team was probably their worst ever, but this 2016 squad, I gotta tell ya, they have a case to be worse. L let's start with the quarterback room, where Cody Kessler and Robert Griffin III's ashes would become the 25th and 26th starting quarterbacks, and Josh McCown is still here too, it's, I mean... What the f*** are we doing here, Cleveland? It's been 17 years, and the best you have at quarterback is Cody Kessler? I... I'm running out of space on this board. Just imagine what it would feel like to be a Browns fan for this whole stretch of dread and misery. I mean, those poor forsaken souls. <laughs> it's about to get so much worse. This shit is about to go off the f***. Wall. The 2016 Browns were terrible, okay? We, we know this. The same bullshit was happening, but th this season just felt a little different. Looking at their roster, seriously, there, there was nothing here. Their best receiver was a quarterback. Their defense actually did have talent, though, like Jordan Poyer and Demario Davis, but they both left after the season and had their best years elsewhere. And also, I need to add this last point. Joe Thomas. This entire time has now made a Pro Bowl in every single season of his career, never missing a start. Dude has just been an immovable pillar while all the walls have just been caving in on him. And Hugh Jackson, 
<laughs> Big Huey here, in year one on the job, uh, got to working. Now, although you probably know how the Hugh Jackson arc is going to end, it's important to know where all this started. Because remember, Hugh Jackson objectively has a better football mind than you or I. Probably. And in Oakland, he actually helped revive Jason Campbell's career for a season or two, so maybe there was a chance he could squeeze whatever life essence was left out of RG3 or something. Put a pin in the Hugh Jackson character development for a second, because it's time to go over the actual games. Because <laughs> there were some fun ones. Week 1, they got embarrassed by Carson Wentz and what could have been. Week 2, they blew a 20-0 first quarter lead to the Ravens. And by just week 3, the Browns had already started three different quarterbacks. Three different guys started in Cleveland by week three due to injuries. But I mean, at least they were actually in a lot of these games, and although they were 0-5, <laughs> that's damn near above average for the Browns at this point. And they did play the Patriots, so maybe at this point they could move on and actually turn things around. And... I mean, I, I don't even need to do a beat drop at this point. You know, 1-15. They lost 14 games in a row, and the only team they managed to defeat was the fucking San Diego Chargers, because as it turns out, some special organizations out there can actually outbrown the Browns rarely. So, Hugh Jackson surely would be fired, right? I mean, not saying he should be fired, but back in 2013, Jimmy Haslam only gave Rob Chudzinski one year on the job, and he won three more games than Hugh did, so, no? Okay, well, fuck what I just said then. He stays. He, he, he's not the problem now. Hugh Jackson is fine. It's purely a talent issue, which, you know, isn't entirely incorrect, but, I mean, this man's offensive schemes were... They were tough to watch. It was almost as if he spent hours a day crafting the perfect scheme weekly to play into his offensive weaknesses and against his opponent's weaknesses. And okay, there's a lot of negative, but if you really don't think things won't get better from here on out, Hugh Jackson himself said if the Browns win one game next season, again, he'll do the unthinkable. The plunge will be taken into the cavity of hell incarnate, known as Lake Erie. A promise he will hopefully never have to live to see happen, and the 2017 Cleveland Browns draft, incidentally, actually was very, very good. Granted, they were forced into taking Miles Garrett, so you can only put so much weight on it, but he is on a Hall of Fame trajectory, and, um... For what it's worth though, in 2017, he only played in 9 games getting hurt almost instantly, so it took some time for him to develop, but also they drafted Jabril Peppers, who is good now on the Patriots, Larry Ogunjobi, who was decently productive, David Njoku, who has been pretty good too when healthy, and instead of taking Deshaun Watson, a quarterback who would later develop some of the best hands in the NFL, and his villain arc will come later, they were confident in another quarterback and decided to go with the Sean Kaiser in the second round to be the next franchise guy, or I guess maybe the first franchise guy, whatever way you look at it, as Deshaun Kaiser would become the 27th starting quarterback and some, some guy named Kevin Hogan would become the 28th, so... Yeah. The Browns front office then took another swing at an aging receiver just like what they did with Dwayne Bowe and signed Kenny Britt to a four-year $32 million deal. Who is Kenny Britt, you may ask? Well, stop asking questions. <laughs> you know, I, I guess to be fair to him though, he was a little bit better than Dwayne Bowe because he would catch 18 passes all year. 18. Nice. <laughs> they then cut Joe Hayden too because he didn't want to take a pay cut and um... Oh yeah, wait, hold on, Josh Gordon was also suspended again. Almost almost forgot to mention that. And so with that, you ready? You think you know pain? You think you understand how it feels to hurt in football? Well, honestly, like I've been saying though, that the Cleveland Browns are a comedy act, nothing more. And at this point, Cleveland Browns fans watch this 2017 team every single Sunday just to feel something, even if that something was to get a cheap laugh in. And in 2017, it was just, n knock on wood, I guess, the worst season any singular franchise has ever had since then. And Lewis got his cup and wide open, and into the end zone, it's a touchdown. Why? Why must the Browns brown so brown? Why can't you brown a little bit lighter? Why? Ah. Uh... <laughs> 
what the f- Pardon my French here, but what the fuck? <laughs> it got worse. They actually found a way. They won three games in 2015. Then they followed that up with a one bomb in 2016. And this season, in 2017, they did the unthinkable, matching the Detroit Lions' historic 0-16 season with a goose egg of their own. And boy, this year was packed to the goddamn brim with classic Browns humor. And more specifically, I want to focus on the last game of the season that just really sealed this Browns team's fate and a place in NFL lore forever. It's December 31st, 2017 AD, and an estimated 50,704 people attended this game all of which I can assume were not sober, because holy f***ing Christ, the Browns were going to play the Pittsburgh Steelers. And you would assume this would just be a routine slaughtering, but the Steelers decided to rest their starters, so maybe the Browns had a chance to get a win in the final week of the season. Um, no, yeah, I, I, I'm whipping one of these out. <laughs> I know, I pretty much only save these for playoff games, but... The Cleveland Browns are truly one of the exceptions, and th this game is worth it. it. Trust me, it's worth the deep dive. We start the game out with a Darius Hayward Bay reverse touchdown. <laughs> Landry Jones to Darius Hayward Bay was an actual thing in this game, but Landry Jones would then go on to throw an interception, and the Browns were still very much in this game after they denied the Steelers from scoring a touchdown on fourth and goal, so... Hey, they had a chance to escape their zero-win destiny. Unfortunately, Cleveland would then have a punt blocked, which led to a Juju Smith-Schuster touchdown. However, however, okay, it's not all bad on this graph. Deshaun Kaiser threw a laser to Josh Gordon, which then set up a rushing touchdown, and after a Rashad Higgins 60-yard touchdown, and then another score... The game was tied at 21 apiece with the Steelers still scoring too because the Browns defense was worse than the Steelers second team offense. We had ourselves a game and it was going to come down to the wire. The Steelers backups versus the Browns trying to put everything out on the line for one more week. Could the Browns defense get a stop when it mattered most? <laughs> I mean, they did not not get a stop because they didn't even get a fucking chance. Juju Smith-Schuster, on the kickoff, returned it for a touchdown. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> How does this even happen? So that was the dagger, 100%, no denying that, but they ended up actually getting a drive going later on, which Duke Johnson would fumble on. So there goes that drive, but then they got another chance, and Deshaun Kaiser threw an interception. This team was doing everything they could to cement the 0-16 season. But the Steelers kept leaving the door open. Josh Gordon and others caught some small passes. You know, it wasn't anything crazy, but progress was being made, which set up fourth down and two. Season on the line. And Deshaun Kaiser, who actually played a pretty damn good game for his standards, an amazing one, made a fantastic play, escaped pressure, and threw a perfect pass to Corey Coleman, who drops it. That's the season. It's over. Just like that. Pure poetry. One of the worst busts in Cleveland Browns history would cement the 0-16 season. And the, the symbolism and foreshadowing that had been flowing through this Browns team since the beginning of the year was just very apparent, okay? Before the year, they decided to take Bill Belichick's hill that he used in Cleveland pre-Art Modell doing the thing and blew it up. So, you know, take that for what you will. And Joe Thomas, a man who's truly seen it all, from the horrors of Brady Quinn to Johnny Manziel, finally fell. The man suffered his first injury of his career that forced him to miss many games, and after completing the illustrious 0-16 season, he had enough. He simply couldn't stomach it anymore, and the Hall of Famer retired from the NFL at the age of 33. The Browns held a parade for their accomplishment. They finished the season first in turnovers and last in turnovers forced. Hugh Jackson kept his promise and dived into the sea of his own sins. And that was the 2017 Brown season in a nutshell. But <laughs> look, if there was one positive, because maybe there was, 
a management change would obviously happen, so it actually, actually cannot get worse. I, I know I've said that a lot, but literally the Browns have hit bedrock. The, the only way to lower it from here was for Art Modell to rise from the grave, because Sashi Brown was gone after doing a great job sabotaging a trade for AJ McCarron, a trade that Hugh Jackson really wanted to happen, but if he had gone through with it, the Browns would have missed out on a certain running back who has a cool t-shirt made after him. The usual rinse and repeat would happen, where the Browns would hire Chiefs executive John Dorsey to be their next GM, and their new head coach would also be... Oh. Never mind. Jump the gun a little bit. Hugh Jackson is still fucking here. From a business perspective, keeping Hugh Jackson in town should baffle your mind, but somehow, the dude actually won the power struggle with the front office and kept his job after winning a singular game in two years. He won one game in near 700 days, and I looked deep, okay? I looked real deep into just trying to fathom why Hugh Jackson was so bad as a head coach. I mean, we can see the losing was there, but why was that? And turns out he suffered from a lot of the same problems that other guys suffered from. Uh, he implemented a scheme first and just kind of forced the talent to work around that scheme rather than doing the vice versa of that. And he also lost the locker room and beefed with a lot of higher up guys, but to me, one clip sums up the biggest problem with Hugh Jackson, and just just look at it. It is it is an absolute insane clip that just, his ego, man, his ego was out of control. I'm gonna say it again, but the chair I sit in, a little different than the chair you guys sit in. I get to watch from a different lens. At the end of the day, I get to drive this bus, and I'm gonna get it the way I want it. That's period, that's just how it works. Did you hear him? The mother basically just said, you know, I hear you, that's a fair point, but um, Unfortunately, I don't care. Y you see my chair? You see this? I'm the boss. I call the fucking shots here, and I mean, does this look like a fun working environment to you? This is why the culture failed to change again. Nobody's having fun behind the walls. Everybody's miserable always, and that's how you just lose and lose and lose over and over again. And it's a big piece as to why, as an organization, from 1999 through 2017, the Browns have only won 88 games, <laughs> averaging out to roughly 4.8 wins a season. Meanwhile, your former coach Bill Belichick has led his team to 222 wins in that same time frame. Fucking pathetic. But a new era would come to light again, because after going 0-16, they held the first overall pick for the fourth time since 1999, and this is where things actually get interesting, because you could make an argument, and I will later on, that the Browns quarterback jersey should have officially ended on April 26th, 2018, when the Cleveland Browns selected Oklahoma quarterback Baker Mayfield. He had it all. The swagger, charisma, criminal history, talent, he was the perfect man for Cleveland. And during the rest of his first draft ever as the GM of the Browns, John Dorsey was just churning up gold. It, it was amazing. Outside of Mayfield, the Browns found two players that, besides Miles Garrett, have legitimate cases to be labeled as the best player on the team over the next five years in cornerback Denzel Ward, who they got from the Deshaun Watson trade, the first one, and running back Nick Chubb and thus began their second attempt at a first overall quarterback. Baker Mayfield seemed like he had a clean path to success, right? So, I mean, Cleveland needed to do everything in their power to break him. But they did do one thing right. Unlike with Tim Couch when they just threw him into the fire, they actually had Tyrod Taylor start the season out and kept him in even after they didn't lose their game in week one. And, hmm. This, this shirt is amazing. You, you gotta love that this even exists. This is peak Cleveland Browns right here. Then week three came along, and Baker Mayfield would finally be unleashed because Tyrod oh. Taylor is a human injury baton, and after entering the battle, the energy just felt a little different. The Browns rallied around Baker and ended up beating the Jets 21-17, and even though Isaiah Crowell picked up maybe the greatest unsportsmanlike penalty ever, this was a gargantuan step forward for every tormented fan of the Cleveland Browns, and then in week four, Baker Mayfield would finally become the starting quarterback of the Cleveland Browns, and Tyrod Taylor would be the 29th, Baker Mayfield would be the 30th, and... I'll go on to explain it later, but these are going to be the last names that I'll ever put on the board. So, let's make it count. Baker's also going to get a picture. I'm going to put him next to Tim Couch. 
Never mind, I am out of room. He's going down here. Of course, I've, I've saved my best for last, obviously. Look at Baker right there. He's never looked better. That's the franchise right there. He's gonna put an end to this curse. All right, it's Baker time. And statistically, the Baker Mayfield era was actually great in his rookie season. By year's end, he was ranked as the best rookie quarterback by PFF grades since Russell Wilson. And this was with fucking Greg Williams as his head coach after they finally, they, they did it. The darkness subsided forever and Hugh Jackson was fired as the head coach of the Cleveland Browns. I, I didn't think it could be done. Yeah, Hugh is gone. And overall though, the 2018 season without him was a year of pure development. Nick Chubb had a breakout game versus the Raiders. Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward were pretty great. And this team just had a bunch of pieces on it now. And finally, 20 years after Tim Couch walked to the guillotine with pride, he looked on in tears to see that the Browns had a franchise quarterback with real talent around him. And after finishing the season with seven whole wins, oh, chill out there for a minute, seven? Wow, it was, it was time to get a real head coach and even more talent around Baker to take full advantage of having a great young quarterback. Well, it seems like there's a little bit too many connections to the 2000 season, because the Cleveland Browns before 2019 were an easy playoff lock by pretty much everybody's standards, and the question then became, was the Super Bowl a realistic expectation for them? And now, every single sane Browns fan at the time was, uh, Definitely skeptical about this narrative, but I swear it was actually the norm at the time. And the main reason for this was the acquisition of an uber-talented disgruntled wideout by the name of Odell Beckham Jr. and a legally troubled running back by the name of Kareem Hunt. These guys were basically here to replace Josh Gordon and Corey Coleman, who evaporated, and along with new head coach Freddie Kitchens, who had been coaching in the NFL since 2007, the Browns, on paper, had their best roster in franchise history, all pros were on offense and defense, a future superstar quarterback for sure, a star running back, a star corner, and it was time. Although maybe the marketing team showing double penetration porn to the higher ups wasn't a great start before the season, but well, whatever, we'll just we'll look past that. And in week one of the 2019 season, the Cleveland Browns would flex their muscles and have their traditional breakout game versus the Tennessee Titans and showed the NFL that they are here. It's Henry over the top, all the way for the touchdown. Into the line, now throws wide open to the end zone. No, they say touchdown. They lost by 30 to Marcus Mariota and the Tennessee Titans, giving up 28 unanswered points in the second half. And instantly too, Freddie Kitchens showed he just, he wasn't ready at all for this job. The discipline from his players was simply not there at all as the Browns committed 18 penalties. 18! To this day, the most any team has ever gotten in a game since 2017. Fuck yeah, Freddie. Good shit. Reddit was having a great time right away. Browns fans were in shambles, but <laughs> little did they know, this was basically the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. It was bad, but yeah, it was it was all downhill from here. And honestly, I don't I don't even know where to start, but I guess let's skip a little bit ahead to week five, where fresh off of allowing over 200 rushing yards to Tevin Coleman and Matt Breida, Baker Mayfield and Odell just weren't working out. And Baker in particular just played the worst game he's ever played in his life versus San Francisco with a passer rating of 13.4. So the frustration was boiling over between these two conflicting personalities. And once again, it was just week five. In week six, they then wasted a good Odell game and a Nick Chubb performance versus Seattle. And also, after that game, Miles Garrett saw a fan asking for a picture and being the good guy that he is, he obliged. So the fan got out of the car and fucking punched him in the face. <laughs> got it, all right, makes sense. And I guess that fan was just taking out his anger for what was to come because after having Super Bowl expectations, the Browns season was all but dead when they fell to the Brandon Allen-led Denver Broncos, and at 2-6, and six, the playoffs were just out of question. Unless, unless they ran the table. Alas, the table was not run. In week 9, their starting safety, Jermaine Whitehead, decided to get a little too silly and threatened to kill a reporter on Twitter, so they cut him. Then in week 11, Miles Garrett also got a little too silly and, you know, did the thing, resulting in him being suspended for the entire season. 
Odell was also pissed off at everyone, but to his credit, he wasn't ranting about it on Twitter that much. Rashad Higgins, a solid wideout, was put in the doghouse all year long by Freddie Kitchens, and to end it all off, in the final week of the season, the best roster in Cleveland Browns history lost to the one-win Cincinnati Bengals, and, and that... That is some textbook football torture right there. They basically just handed Browns fans a nice ice cream cone with sprinkles on it before the season, and then proceeded to punch them in the face and beat them into a bloody pulp. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cleveland Browns. Th this is the way. There is no deviation from the formula. Misery is the only constant, and even with pretty much everything going wrong on the field, Freddie Kitchens and John Dorsey got their bodies thrown in a bath of acid, and that was it for them. But Baker Mayfield's regression was actually the most shocking part of the 2019 season. Attempts were up, touchdowns were down, picks were up, passer rating was down, and it was just a horrible season for Baker altogether. But at least Baker started the whole season, so... I guess do with that what you will. And now, it was new coaching search time for about the 18th time this video. And the final coaching prospects came down to two dudes, Kevin Stefanski and Josh McDaniels. But uh, very luckily for them, McDaniels stayed in the hive to marinate for a little bit longer, and they chose to hire Kevin Stefanski, their best coach in their new franchise's history. And they also hired Andrew Barry as their new GM, who remains with the team as of right now, and although the jury is still out on him and his mindset of seemingly being a little bit too invested in the present over the future, there's no arguing that the Browns have basically had their most success under his leadership. So, I mean, maybe Kevin Stefanski could turn things around, but he did not walk into an easy environment. His two best offensive players outside of the Chubster were both having interesting off-seasons. Uh, Baker Mayfield honestly looked pretty guilty with his... <laughs> Jesus, dude. Why? His Cheesecake Factory sloppy toppy incident, and Odell Beckham had people accusing him of liking to be sh** on, so... Right away, the ego management job that Kitchens failed at was already cranked up for Kevin to even attempt to contain instantly. All right, whatever, who cares? Let's let's just all laugh at the Browns again, okay? Because in week one, it looked like they were gonna throw away another season. I, <laughs> I'm getting sick of this, dude. I really am. Well, wait a minute. Hold on, maybe this Kevin Stefanski guy is onto something, because right after getting a meat sandwich shoved down their throat from Lamar, Odell Beckham started to make some plays, and he even iced the game versus Dallas with a rushing touchdown, so finally, Odell Beckham, the Odell Beckham that we all knew was starting to get back on track, and he tore his ACL trying to make a tackle after Baker Mayfield threw a pick. And this injury would officially mark the end of Odell Beckham's career as an above-average wide receiver. Injuries also just plagued the Browns during this entire season, too, as Nick Chubb, the stoic warrior, would suffer an MCL injury, Denzel Ward missed games with a groin pull, and also this was basically the COVID year, so that was, that was a thing, but... That was seemingly all the Browns needed. The plague taking over was enough to give the Browns a chance at being good, because that's all they could really ask for from the football gods. A shot to prove themselves as worthy. And with a date with King Henry and the team that almost took down the Chiefs last year, this was the opportunity they were looking for. Simply put, if the Browns beat the Titans, they would not only basically clinch the playoffs, but they'd have the respect of everyone else in the NFL. Baker Mayfield needed to prove it, Kevin Stefanski needed to prove it, Miles Garrett needed to prove it, and they did. Baker Mayfield played the best game he's ever played as a Cleveland Brown. Four touchdowns, 300 yards, a near-perfect passer rating, and leading the Browns to a statement 41-35 win over the Tennessee Titans was just... It was beautiful, and after Lamar emptied his bowels first then, the Cleveland Browns, they did it. They finished the 2020 NFL season with an 11-5 record, their best record in franchise history since 1999, and they made the playoffs. And unlike in 2002, Kelly Holcomb or some backup wasn't going to start for this game. No, it was going to be Baker Mayfield, the Cleveland Browns franchise quarterback. Obviously, it couldn't be easy for Cleveland to actually get into the playoffs, though, because they almost blew it versus the Jets and versus the Steelers' backups. It came down to a third down conversion by Baker, but f*** it, they made it in. And their opponent for their first playoff game since their matchup with the Steelers in 2002 would be 
the Pittsburgh Steelers, a team that almost beat them without their starters in Week 17 and were 11-0 at one point, and also were led by two All-Pros on defense at the top of their game in TJ Watt and Minka Fitzpatrick. And add that on to Kevin Stefanski being ruled out for this game because he caught the disease, the general expectation was Browns are going to Brown again for sure, right? I mean, although the Steelers were just on pace for a historic meltdown, the raw power of the Cleveland Browns' ability to just do Browns things will prove to be way too much, surely. And so... Browns fans sat on their couch and were getting ready to watch a playoff game, a foreign concept to them, and I'm sure they had two feelings. One of them was very excited to just watch a playoff game, but also I'm sure they weren't they weren't super excited to get hurt again, because it was going to happen just like it did in 2002, right? They were going to maybe have a lead at some point and then completely blow it, but the football gods... They looked down upon Cleveland and saw those poor fans that had to suffer through Tim Couch, Brady Quinn, Brandon Whedon, Johnny Manziel, Hugh Jackson, and so much more and said, you know what? You know what, Browns fans? We'll give you one. We'll give you this one game for pure happiness. And the game would literally end on the first play. Uh, option play? Oh no, and they fumble the snap, dude, what the fuck? Dude! Oh, fuck you! Hold on, let's get the towel out. 21 nothing in the first quarter! Let's go, yes! <laughs> this was the greatest game in this new Cleveland Brown era. They actually did it. Weinstein threw four picks, and after jumping out to a 28-0 lead in the first quarter, the Steelers completed their collapse, and the Browns finally won their first ever playoff game since 1999. It's just, it's, it's a shame that the greatest threat to world peace stood before them. And he wanted blood, because Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs would be waiting. And Mahomes played well in this game, and to be honest, uh, the Browns were overmatched. It's just, this divisional game versus the Chiefs could have been so much different if the refs didn't miss this helmet-to-helmet -helmet call near the end of the first half, because instead of being down 19-3 to at the half, which actually happened, Cleveland could have scored a touchdown, denying the Chiefs a field goal, and all of a sudden, 16-10 to going into the third quarter, receiving the ball doesn't really seem that bad. But that's not how it went, and Chad Henney ended up replacing an injured Patrick Mahomes, giving the Browns a chance, but after playing like absolute shit, Andy Reid's big balls picked up a first down, relying on Chad Henney. That was the game, with the Browns giving the Chiefs the best fight out of anyone in the AFC, falling just a few plays behind, 17-22. to So this was, this was rough, but there was no reason to believe the Browns wouldn't be better next season, right? Is what I would actually say if this weren't the Cleveland Browns, but um... Yeah, in just week two of the 2021 season, Baker Mayfield, the no questions asked franchise guy, injured his throwing shoulder on, ironically, just like Odell's injury, an interception he threw trying to make a tackle, and fully tore his labrum in his non-throwing shoulder, and for the remainder of the season, the injury would only get worse, and Baker clearly just was not the same player playing through it. Now, it's it's good to be back to the norm, because the bullfuckery just returned. They lost a game to the Chargers because of a horrible P.I. call, Baker dislocated his shoulder against the Cardinals, and then the goofiest of goofy Browns moments happened when Odell Beckham Jr.'s father, his dad, cooked Baker Mayfield on fucking Instagram, which killed any trade value for Odell on the market, forcing the Browns to cut the man they traded for just two years prior after doing almost nothing to help the Browns win. And just when the Browns thought they had a shot at reviving their season, they lost to the Mac Jones-led Patriots 7-45, to and then the year officially ended after one more loss to the Raiders in which they were forced to start Nick Mullins because basically their entire team had the virus. And the Cleveland Browns finished the 2021 season with a a disappointing 8-9 record and, I guess, uh, symbolically? Ended with their defensive tackle getting arrested nude while fighting a police officer in a school zone. That's how I imagine it feels to be a Browns fan. Now, 8 wins is not nothing, and this was still an overwhelming positive for Browns fans. They just had one decision that needed to be made. Is Baker Mayfield still the franchise quarterback? And this was quite literally their most important decision to make in franchise history. Stick with Baker, let him heal, and see what he can do with the newly acquired Amari Cooper, or do you decide to go a different route and test your luck in the QB market? And 
the Cleveland Browns decided to give up on their best quarterback in franchise history, sending Baker Mayfield to the Carolina Panthers, where after bouncing around a little bit, he would eventually prove the Browns wrong in Tampa Bay, showing the league that he can still be an above average starter in the NFL. So, okay, I guess Baker's gone, but uh, let's see who they bring in instead. Deshaun Watson. It's the, it's the guy they wanted. They traded away three first round picks and more to Houston and handed a five year $230 million fully guaranteed contract to a racist. This isn't even fun anymore. Deshaun Watson would only be suspended for 11 games too, so honestly the Browns got a little lucky there, and all they could do is hope that every Browns fan would just forget what he did, allegedly, I guess, and as long as the athlete can throw the ball far, it's all good. So it's time for the 2022 season, and everything just went to complete shit. In week one, Baker Mayfield almost got his revenge versus the Browns with the Panthers, but Cleveland got a little lucky. So the football gods smited them down just one week later as the Browns lost to Joe Flacco's Jets after one of the most incredible meltdowns you'll ever see. Basically, all hope for the year was put on Deshaun Watson's comeback, and to his credit, Jacoby Brissett, consistently one of the most underrated backup quarterbacks, was doing a great job and was keeping the ship relatively afloat and even took down his mentor, Thomas Edward Patrick Brady Jr. And, um, anyway, it was week 13 time now. Week... 13, the awaited date where Deshaun Watson would make his return versus none other than the Houston Texans, his former team. And in this game, there, there would be rust, people expected that, but my god, Deshaun Watson was fucking terrible. Watson faking the chub to the end zone, it's picked off! Petrie! Thankfully, for humanity, dude went 12 for 22, 131 yards, zero touchdowns, and a pick. Then for the remainder of the season, Watson went back and forth. One game, he'd give Browns fans some hope that he still got that potential to be special at him, and then another, you'd think Jeff Garcia was back under center. Because there was just no consistency with him. And the 2022 season ended with a seven-win record, with the usual guys in Chubb, Garrett, and Ward being good, but that's about all there was to report. And now we entered the 2023 season, where the biggest change in Cleveland was the hiring of defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz. And I know I haven't really mentioned the coordinators that much, but Jim would really just completely maud the hell out of this Browns defense in one season, as they would become easily the most ferocious unit this season when they were healthy. And pairing that alongside a truly elite O-line, as long as Deshaun Watson was okay, this Browns team was looking like they were gonna be maybe great. But like I said, the whole season would come come down to one thing. Does Deshaun Watson still know how to play football? And funny enough, for, for the second year in a row, it was the same thing. He'd play a few good games here or there, then he'd play some absolutely terrible games, throw some horrible balls, and then he'd get hurt. And honestly, I'd love to say that Deshaun Watson is just terrible now, but the fact is there still isn't really a large enough sample size. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's bad, but I'm not confident enough to say that. And right before he suffered a season ending shoulder injury versus Baltimore, in that second half versus the Ravens, he played pretty much the best he's played all year long. So I don't even know what to say with him anymore. And to me, Deshaun Watson's confusing season in 2023 just added to the tragedy of the 2023 Browns. On one hand, their season was very successful. They actually made the playoffs again, thanks to Joe Flacco and the defense but got pummeled by CJ Stroud and company with Deshaun Watson trade graphics getting thrown up all over Twitter. But injuries just ruined this entire year. Nick Chubb, the most loyal running back a man could ask for, suffered a near career-ending injury in just week two. Grant Delpit missed time. Denzel Ward was hurt. Deshaun Watson, obviously. Maurice Hurst was lost for the season. Jedrick Wells was lost for the season too. And in a world where Texans Deshaun Watson was under center for the Cleveland Browns and Nick Chubb and the other guys didn't just get horribly unlucky with injuries, and you pair that along with the Jim Schwartz and Miles Garrett Defensive Player of the Year-led defense, I firmly believe the Cleveland Browns could have had a Super Bowl run. If you've watched some of my other content, I'm pretty sure I've said that statement before, but only now do I realize it, it's all part of the pain. All of it. Although the Browns quarterback jersey may have ended with Baker Mayfield, some people have it still going strong. And if one thing's for certain, the comedy act is still going. And maybe, just maybe, this is the Cleveland Browns' eternal fate. I mean, look at this board, man. Look at this. Look at all the names 
I mean, do you even remember all these guys? Ty Detmer, Spurgeon Wynn, Bruce Grodkowski, Brian Hoyer, Brady Quinn, Johnny Manziel. There's so much failure here. And if Deshaun Watson doesn't get his shit together on the field, because off the field is just a lost cause, it actually has potential to get worse. So yeah, ever since they've been reforged from pure greed in 1999, they've been walking around the NFL wasteland as a soulless husk, a pinata for the rest of the league to push around and laugh at. And as it's looking, things may never ever change. Anyways, if you like this video, then subscribe because I got a lot of videos on the channel just like this one. And if you did like this video, may I recommend the Patriots documentary I did a little while back. It's got similar time length and it's pretty good, trust me. And also thanks to all my Patreons for pledging a dollar. It truly does mean a lot and I have a lot more planned in the future. So feel free to join the community if you want. And anyways, until next time.